You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by iWalkUp, flexible loans built for small businesses. Today, we are in Agrigento. Cozze cittene, cozze, cozze piscine, non spiego de cicora, non spiego de cicora. Cozze cittene, cozze, cozze piscine, non spiego de cicora. Where are we today, Lionel? We're in Sicily. We're in Agrigento in Sicily on Italian soil. We've transferred across from Hungary. Long old journey, wasn't it? You a bit groggy today? Always, Richard. <laughs> no rest day for the transfer, chaps. I'm not sure how we got from Tokai last night to an airport. Um, didn't really, didn't include that in the footnotes. Make your own way there. Make your own way to Sicily, ch- chaps. A secret tunnel. <laughs> A bullet train <laughs> in a tunnel, and we emerged in Sicily today. I came in a hot air balloon. Okay, so, yeah. that's good for you. Um, the uh, the actual Giro was going to do this as well, carry on without a rest day, a long transfer, and a late start to today's stage, and we're we're doing the same thing. You had all sorts of strange ideas about um, escaping over the border into Croatia, flying from Zagreb. That was going to be impossible Did, yeah. because of the costs of dropping off the car, um, the mm. the hire car in a different country. Yeah, that was all logistically very challenging. So we, we came just a straightforward tunnel. What's coming up in today's episode, please, Daniel? Well, today, Rich, um, we, we feel slightly sheepish, contrite about the fact that in previous Giri, we've been quite flippant, glib maybe, um, unlike us, I know. But um, when we've spoken about the, the mafia, um, nervous napalm has, has had some anxious moments over the past few years. When we've discussed the mafia, we've discussed particularly the Calabrian mafia, the Andrea but of course Sicily is famous for its mafia as well, Cosa Nostra. But we thought it was about time we talked um, in more serious terms about the mafia. So we're going to do that with the help of a, of a real expert on that particular subject. But we also thought that it was a good opportunity to discuss the whole issue of skullduggery and everything that's sort of nefarious in the Giro. Some fantastic stories of skullduggery in the Giro. So we're mainly going to be revisiting those today a top 10 isn't it we're running through a, a top 10 of of giro scandals of so scandals sta- and and yeah examples of skullduggery in the giro stand by for that pop pickers but can we have a tale of the tapper please lionel first we can of course stage four of our giro like the real giro starting in monreale and finishing in agrigento 197 and a half kilometers the only difference or the significant difference daniel is that you have taken us off course slightly to route us through the village of Corleone of Godfather fame. And I guess that's because we're going to sort of redress the balance when it comes to treating the mafia as as a sort of cinematic phenomenon, delve into, you know, what the mafia is really about with uh, the help of John Dickey a bit later on. We are going via Corleone, which is sort of in the the Sicilian interior. If you head south from um, Palermo or Monreale, where we're actually starting is a suburb of Palermo. Um, you head inland and Corleone is, is um, in the sort of dust bowl of central Sicily and famous, synonymous with the Mafia, probably, well, mainly for an international audience because of the, the Godfather film and Don Vito Corleone. So we're going to be talking to D- John Dickey, author of several books about the the Mafia. And we're also taking another detour. We're not going to have time to get into this today, but... Um, if anyone wants to read great books about the, the Mafia fiction, um, which also deals with the Mafia, um, we're going via the birthplace of um, Leonardo Sciascia, who's a famous Sicilian writer. I would recommend that anyone who's interested in the Mafia and wants to read some fantastic Sicilian fiction um, reads his The Day of the Owl. Back to the cycling, and uh, people who were following cycling in the 90s will know that the World Championships were held in and around Agrigento in 1994. That was the year that Luc Leblanc won for France ahead of Claudio Chiapucci of Italy. Like the World Championship road race that year, we will be going through the Valley of Temples. We actually drove through a couple of years ago on the Giro, didn't we, Daniel? That year was also the year that Chris Boardman won the men's time trial. I think that was the first men's individual time trial at the world championships for professionals so uh, and a, and a, a little known german called jan ulrich was the bronze medalist that day he wasn't even a professional but he finished 
um, on the podium of the of the elite race. I'm sure everyone is wondering about our Giro, the bit that everyone can ride on the RGT platform. Well, today's segment uh, heads up towards the Pian del Leone, literally means the Plateau of the Lion. So I'll be really at home there. Let's hear how we got on on the course a little bit earlier. No, it's freewheeling there because I am coming to you today from the start of stage four and straight out the blocks it's an eight percent climb blimey anyway another long day in the saddle today for us Giro riders on the rgt platform and a little reminder that um there are organized rides everyday races and group rides at midday and 6 30 pm and then the following morning at 7 a.m that's all uk time if people want to race the courses um also if you want to have a look at GC. We've got about 350 riders so far doing every stage. Go to veloviewer.com forward slash TCP. That's veloviewer.com forward slash TCP. Great to see so many of you out there in your cycling podcast pink jerseys. Thanks for all the waves and messages of encouragement. I'll carry on now. You are listening to the cycling podcast at our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by IWOCA, flexible loans built for small businesses. IWOCA.co.uk Thank you very much indeed to our title sponsors, IWOCA. Very proud to have them as our main supporters and uh, they're enabling us to be here covering our Giro. IWOCA are an award-winning finance company who specialise in lending to small businesses. They were founded in 2011 and they have issued more than a billion pounds to companies ranging from startups to established businesses. If you'd like to know more about Iwaka and they support cycling as well, this is Kendall Cycle Club as well as a cycling podcast, then go to iwaka.co.uk. Now, in today's stage four episode of our Giro, we are looking at scandal and skullduggery. We've got a, a top 10 of Giro scandals. We'll maybe offer a ranking uh, at the end, but we offer them to you now in no particular order. So what's your first scandal, Daniel? I think you're going to take us back about 18 years. So, chaps, when we think of sort of skullduggery, sabotage and scandal in the recent history of Grand Tours, we tend to think, I would say the, the one that most people think of is the 1998 Tour de France Festina scandal and 2006 Tour de France Operación Puerto. But the one which is, is criminally, criminally being the operative word, underrated in my eyes is 2002 Giro. Obviously, I was following cycling already covering cycling at that time but I'd forgotten just how extraordinary it was and I'm going to give you a timeline here so so buckle up so 2002 Giro started in Groningen in the Netherlands stage two was won by Stefano Garzelli of Mappe who was one of the favorites he got the pink jersey he gave a urine sample that night that would subsequently test positive for probenicid that was stage two on the day of stage three, Antonio Variale, who was a Panaria rider, was arrested for his involvement in a doping ring operating out of Brescia. But he was not in the Giro, but it was it was important for subsequent events. Um, after stage four, Domenico Perfetto, also from Panaria, found, uh, found out there was a warrant for his arrest. He left the race. He tried to hand himself in um, at a Brescia police station, and he was arrested while trying to hand himself in because he was spotted by police um, in the town of Brescia. So that was stage four. After stage five, Nicola Chesini, who was in the black jersey, so last on general classification, Panaria rider, he was arrested in the team hotel. First rider ever, only rider to be arrested on the Giro. So he obviously left the race. Filippo Perfetto, also of Panaria, left that night after learning that he was involved and being investigated in the same uh, investigation. So we're up to stage five. Stage five is won by Garzelli who was in the pink jersey. That night, he finds out he's tested positive a few days earlier, but he stays in the race for the time being. Same evening, Roberto Scambelluri of, of Mercatone Uno and Fat Zakirov of Panaria also find out that they've tested positive for a new generation EPO at the Grande Partenza in Groningen. Zakirov never rides another race, never rides another day of racing in his life. Scambelluri does six more stages. Stage six, Gilberto Simoni, another favourite to win the race, says that cycling might be ending. Stage nine. After stage nine, news breaks that Simoni tested positive for cocaine at the Giro del Trentino a few weeks earlier. 
He thinks it was used as an anesthetic when he went to the dentist on the day of the test. Eventually, he'll be absolved because the Italian Cycling Federation accept that there may have been enough cocaine to trigger a positive test in sweets from Peru given to him by his auntie. Stage 9, this is. Stage 10! Stage 10, Garzelli leaves, although his team think that the orange juice in the Mape Hotel may have been sabotaged, and that might have caused a positive test. Stage 11, Simone, who's still in the race, wins the stage. He doesn't start the next day. Stage 15, Francesco Casagrande, who is now the favourite to win because Garzelli and Simone have gone, he gets kicked out of the race for biffing Freddy Garcia, a Gianni Savio rider. Mario Cipollini, who, and when you're accused of unsportsmanlike conduct by Mario Cipollini, you know you've done something really terrible. He says, Casa Grande, uh, I didn't like what Casa Grande did, kicking a kid who's, who's just trying to do his job 12,000 kilometers from his home. That was actually not bad from Cipollini, 12,000 kilometers from home. I looked this up, and Freddy Garcia was from... 10,000 kilometers from home in Colombia. So that was a quite a good guess. Anyway, we're now in the so we're now in the Dolomites up to stage 15. In stage 16 there's a police raid of the hotels of uh, Panaria, Saeco, Mape and Mercatone Uno and um, they find various incriminating <laughs> evidence. I'm not even going to go any further. You have been listening to our top 10 scandals <laughs> from the Giro. Um, we'll see you again tomorrow night for <laughs> stage 5. Fantastic. We've got an interview with Cadell Evans on that topic. Now, Cadell Evans was writing for Map by a teammate of Stefano Garzelli. And you've missed the biggest scandal of all, uh, Daniel, uh, from your list there. And it happened on the eve of the Giro in Holland, where Garzelli and others on the Map by team tried to drag Cadell Evans to a Zuccaro concert. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't know about this. <laughs> so we'll hear, we'll hear about that from Cadell Evans oh, in, a couple, in a couple of days. But certainly packing a lot into that 2002 Giro. And, it, you know, all of that is incredible. But what happened to Cadell Evans was also extraordinary and we felt was worth an episode on its own. So we will hear that, as I say, for our stage six, I think. Just uh, a couple of points there, Daniel. Simone and Garcelli were the previous two winners of the Giro going into that 2002 Giro, just to yeah. give the context of you know, how big these stories were. These, this wasn't kind of peripheral riders uh, falling foul of um, <laughs> just some ordinary blood doping, was it? I mean, the, the Peruvian I mean, sweet, we, we, sweet we... story was, was wonderful. <laughs> I mean, back in those days, we were quite matter of fact about these things. But imagine sort of transpose that to a modern Tour de France. <laughs> imagine, imagine Froome, Quintana, and and I don't know Pino and Bardet all being kicked out on pretty much consecutive days, and you know, for for ingesting Ecuadorian second, lozenges or... Second point, the pink jersey, of course, for the race leader, the green jersey for the king of the mountains in the Giro. Um, when a rider had a warrant for their arrest, what colour jersey did they wear? Was it kind of black and white hoops or maybe orange? I don't know, like a prison jumpsuit? Uh, some kind of... Maybe they should have had a jersey for anyone who is... With, like, bir bird's feet on it. <laughs> with, exactly. And finally, should just say, uh, the winner of the Giro was Paolo Savoldelli, who... Uh, well, I mean, the whole race was like a game of it's a knockout, wasn't it? He was just the, the last man that managed to wobble <laughs> over the line in, a, in an eagle's costume. Or a falcon's costume, sorry. The falcon. Part of me is thinking that we shouldn't have bothered with this fictional route. We should have just done a, a day-by-day... <laughs> sort of revisited day by day the 2002 Giro. Amarcord, I remember. Well, we had a quite a dramatic morning, didn't we? Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd almost forgotten. Yeah, we were raided by the police. Well, we weren't raided well, by the, the police. The hotel was raided by the police. We, I came down to breakfast, line was looking even more tense than usual. Yeah, I was really <laughs> tense. And he sort of started motioning towards a table in the corner, and there were about four or five people sat around the table, two of whom we'd met the previous night, they were the owners of our hotel, and one of the gentlemen who I didn't recognise then proceeded to come over, I thought he was going to ask me my thoughts on today's stage, um, how, I, <laughs> how I felt that Fabio was was, fav was faring in the Giro so far, but no, he said, um, we think a crime has been committed, and then you two are witnesses, and you're going to have to give us a statement. I was very glad that he said witnesses are not suspects, but it was, it was a very tense morning, and I came down to breakfast a little bit before for you Daniel couldn't work out what was going on because basically they were saying we can't serve you breakfast at the moment there's a problem these 
gentlemen were in the reception and in the, the dining room area and I wondered whether they were threatening the owners in some way. Obviously they were, but they were doing it in the spirit of law enforcement or crime investigation rather than sort of demanding money with menaces, which Mo- was my first instinct. Mobile phones were allegedly thrown out of windows this morning when the police arrived. Uh, it, it's it's yeah. the biggest police raid at the Giro d'Italia since 2001 when riders and suitcases and syringes were were hurled out of Team windows or yeah windows. yeah um, amazing stuff but quite unsettling not least because we were the only guests in the hotel i know we and exposed. well last night we had trouble recording because uh, our equipment was buzzing there was a real horrible buzz on our equipment we had to kind of go old school and use just one again, handheld again, recorder of italian cycling about 15 years ago we were being, being tapped. were we being bugged i mean was the room bugged was that was there electronic equipment in our hotel that was interfering with our recording equipment i don't know now i mean I, who knows I'm, I'm kind of half expecting to google my name in about six months time and find i've been cited in some kind of court case in uh, perugia do you not google your name every six days <laughs> no i certainly don't well that was two years ago daniel we were in osimo uh, the day after we'd been in assisi now your role on the giro is to shepherd me round without getting me into any kind of trouble uh, translating for me and uh, well i never anticipated being questioned by the police and having them write out uh, my <laughs> statement um and in italian and then you you basically just <laughs> i was very cavalier you, you just glossed I? over the translation oh yes it says something like you you woke up in the morning and you heard a commotion and no, nothing this and i was like well hang on a minute this has got my signature on it am i going to be summoned to a court at some point to... well, we were we were fully expecting weren't we to be contacted by the police um, months later fortunately well i i move around a lot i'm a bit of a nomad so and um, there might be letters from the assisi police that <laughs> many of my previous addresses but basically it turned out we suspected to be uh, some kind of financial dodge by the hoteliers wasn't it they were not declaring uh, taxes on guests staying in the hotel that was the allegation anyway but we were caught up in it as totally innocent bystanders sure you were sure you were so that's number nine that's number two sorry we'll uh, move on to number in three. no particular Go order on. at the moment no we're, we're not order. proceeding no, we're in not. any particular order we might mu- we might we might offer our podium at the end of the the pod today and for the next one Lionel uh, Daniel we're going back to the early 1960s aren't we and a, a little known double Giro champion the last Italian to win two Giri in a row amazingly uh, my name is Herbie Sykes and I'm the author of a new book called Balmamion it's the story of uh, an Italian rider named Franco Balmamion who won the Giro in 62 and 63 essentially uh, Balmamion was the GC rider of Carpano and De Filippis was the stage hunter. De Filippis was a really famous guy. He was 32. Balmamion was 22. So one really famous, really experienced, a big superstar. Balmamion was just starting out. Supposed to ride for GC, but then shipped eight, got, got, had a hunger flat on stage two and shipped eight minutes. And so a long and very intricate story short, they had to change roles. Balmamion was then obliged to hunt for stages and De Filippis had to ride for GC. He was capable of riding for GC, but he didn't like to. Basically, what happened was that Al Mamion, in, in going with the brakes, just kept chipping away at the thing and gradually hauled himself back into GC contention because the GC guys didn't really bother with him, it's fundamentally. And he was also extremely strong, I mean, the strongest guy in the race. At a certain point, he took the Maglia Rosa in the transition stage. So he's lost eight minutes, got the eight minutes back, Got in another break, claimed the Maglia Rosa. At that point, De Filippis has lost it completely. And it's just become essentially a civil war within the team. Fundamentally, what's happened, Nino's gone home. During the Giro d'Italia, he's gone home because he's not coping at all with this. He doesn't like the fact that Balmamion is popular and he's getting lots of attention and has the Maglia Rosa. So he goes home. The owner of Carpano meets him at home in the small hours of the morning. And in order to avert a, a PR catastrophe, signs him, uh, writes him a massive check. 
And so Nino then comes back to the Giro, promises to help Balmamion to retain the Maglia Rosa all the way to Milan, but in point of fact does precisely the opposite. And he's absolutely mutinous, does everything within his, everything he possibly can to try and denude Balmamion of the Maglia Rosa to a point where Balmamion actually finishes up having to pay riders from ostensibly rival teams to work for him against his teammates. And for the rest, you're probably going to need to read the book, but it is madness stuff. So that was Herbie Sykes. And a very kind of not dissimilar scenario played out 25 years later in 1987 uh, with Stephen Roach and Roberto Vicentini, teammates on Carrera, who went head-to-head in the 87 Giro. Vicentini was the reigning champion, so he could have emulated Balmami on in 87. Uh, he didn't, and Roach won, but... He did. He did so uh, on an Italian team in, at times, quite a clandestine way. He had to be pretty sneaky, uh, use all his his smarts, Stephen Roach, and uh, won. And in in doing so, and then finding himself in the pink jersey, encountered quite a lot of hostility from Vicentini, from within his team, and from the Italian fans. A couple of years ago, I spoke to Stephen Roach about his Giro win in '87 uh, for a friend special. Let's hear a little excerpt from that now. My, my master had to be protect me and my food because we were afraid of somebody poisoning me. And my mechanic, Patrick Valk, had to prepare and look after my bike because we were afraid of somebody sabotaging my bike. So it was very complicated and, um, and very lonely. I was getting very, very worried because there were people trying to hit me on the climb the climbs. There were people taking rice in the mouth in the last minute, a, a mouthful of wine and spitting the wine and rice at me. Um, banners, Roche Bastardo, Roche Via Casa, incredible banners uh, all over the place, and it was very, very hostile. When I finished, the, I had the jersey on my back for where it was four, five, six, seven days, and arrived in the finish line, and I was kind of waiting for someone to give me a towel, but there was nobody there to wait for me, nobody whatsoever. And like, I mean, I was kind of, I was a star for five days. <laughs> I had pink jerseys in my back, I had interviews everywhere, I was, you know, I was, became famous, you know. And all of a sudden then, buff dropped. Just someone unplugged me, you know. I'll always remember, even to this day, when I walked into the, um, the restaurant, Massimo Girotto turned around to me and said, Stefano, you shouldn't have done that. And I was so upset, I turned around and walked away again. And uh, that was the beginning of a kind of a hostile few days. I went over the top of the hill and went to the front and went down the, fr- the, the, the descent quite fast. And um, like I didn't get out of the saddle. And, like, what's the, what is the determination of attack? Does somebody, must somebody get out of the saddle? Must somebody accelerate? I just rode off the front and went down the descent a little faster than everybody else. And I joined the group, the front group by the bottom. Whereas Vizantini could have followed me. Anybody could have followed me. But... Apparently, I went down the descent too fast. But that's not attacking, that's, I went down too fast. So I get to the bottom anyway, I joined the group, and it's about a minute or so, or 45 seconds between the group behind. And um, I'm sitting there saying, okay, well, there's still a lot of flat to come in the final climb. This is a bit suicidal, because Bianchi's going to ride, Panasonic's going to ride, but at the end of the day, that's what I wanted, is to push the other guys to ride, and Vizantini could get a handy ride. But it was suicidal for me, because if they ride to catch me before the end... Will I have the legs to go with them on the final climb? So I wasn't yet thinking about myself, you know, about myself taking over the pink jersey. I was saying this is suicidal. So the car came up and it says, Stephen, um, uh, what are you doing? So well, you know, there's nobody in the front. So I, I thought, well, it'd be good if there was a career rider here. And that way, t- the teammates haven't got to ride on the flat. They can let somebody else ride and ride for Roberto. No, 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 no. Stephen, you don't understand. It says, um, the Carrera team are riding behind you as well. What are they riding behind me for? There's uh, nobody dangerous in this group. It's only myself. And if you wait a few minutes, the Panasonics will ride or the Bianchi will ride. They said, well, well, not really. It's, um, they're all everywhere. They're ones and twos. Everyone's totally disorganized. You went down that descent too fast. And there's uh, bodies everywhere. So they're totally disorganized. If, um, if you don't stop, they never catch you. I said, well, isn't that great? We can win the, win the Giro. So he said, politely told me, listen, Stefan, that isn't the question. Roberto's riding behind. You have to wait. As well, if Roberto's going to ride behind me, tell him he wants to keep riding. He says, I'll stop riding if he stops riding. If he doesn't stop riding, I'm going to stop him riding. And when he catches me, I'm going to go again. So he chooses 
just tell him. No, Stephen, you best, you better stop. No way. So I went down a gear and uh, I, I, I got this power from I don't know where. And I always remember looking back and then a big, long, long straight road with a heat haze on it. And my whole team were riding behind me. And I'm riding on the front of this four-man brake. Ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. That's obviously Roach's side of the story, Rich. Um, we tried, didn't we? Or I tried um, when we were working on that episode to con- contact Roberto Vicentini. He doesn't give many interviews, hasn't given many about that 87 tour. It's still a very sore point with him. Did manage to speak to him, but he sort of gave me the slip. I mean, it's the sort of Jan Ras manoeuvre. He told me on for about six days consecutively, you know, gave me a time to call him and he was never available. So what I took from that was that he, um, he didn't really want to revisit 1987 Giro, which ended infamously, I think, with him. Did he not saw up his bike and put it in a a plastic bag and vow never to get on a bike again. Um, I mean, he did get on a bike again, but his career after that point was certainly, I think, quite badly affected by the events of the 87 year. And, and now, of course, he's, a, he's an undertaker. One of these Italian riders, and there have been a few who only ever really shone in the Giro, didn't, didn't he? It, it seemed to bring out the best in him, a, a bit like... Um our old friend uh, Simon Spielak at the <laughs> Tour de Romandy. Uh, it seemed to be the only race where he really uh, that he really cared about. I don't know if that's fair or unfair. That was my impression. He was from quite a wealthy background, wasn't he, Daniel, as well? I mean, cycling was a, not necessarily a hobby job for him, but um, he didn't perhaps endear himself to the Tifosi because you know, he wasn't a sort of a, a man of the earth, a man of the countryside, so I gather. Anyway, we'll hear a bit more about that Giro from someone who was photographing it, uh, Graham Watson, who will be the subject of an episode in around the second week of our Giro. He did win a couple of stages of the Vuelta, I'll give him that, but um, didn't ride. He only he only finished the Vuelta once, finished two tours, but didn't um, didn't pull up any trees. Anyway, moving on, what's our next uh, top ten Giro scandal, please, Daniel? Well, it's one of the more famous ones, I think. Um, Marco Pantani being kicked out of the of a Giro d'Italia that he was. He was almost certain to win in 1999 at Madonna di Campiglio, where the Giro actually was supposed to go in 2020. Um, This year, we're not going there on our Giro. But yeah, Pantani had completely dominated that Giro. His popularity, his status in Italy was at its zenith. There was only one mountain stage to go and on the morning of that mountain stage he learned that he'd um, his hematocrit was over the 50% limit and he was he was kicked out and um, yeah a real a real commotion real really dramatic scenes um, that morning in Madonna Campiglio pictures that went all over the world and I think we all remember of him leaving the hotel in Madonna Campiglio um, there was all sorts of well conspiracy theorists um, go on to, to this day about what actually happened um, whether he'd been sort of stitched up somehow there was I mean, we're going to talk about the mafia. There's been a lot of talk in Italy about mafia involvement, about um, betting um, scams, um, someone having got the nod days earlier that Pantani wasn't going to make it to Milan and, and you know, large sums of money potentially being being um, put on that. I was in Italy that day, um, that year, 1999. My parents were actually visiting. I was living in Padova at the time, and my parents were visiting me, and, and, and they'd sort of schlep me around some churches or, you know, piazzas or art galleries or something in the morning. And um, I was looking all, forward all to... All sulky-faced. All sulky yeah, faced and I was looking forward... Well, we were, we were visiting Castelfranco Veneto that day, and it was a, it's a beautiful town. I recommend um, it to, to anyone if you're in that area, the northeast of Italy, to visit Castelfranco Veneto. But we were there... And I finally managed to escape and and got to a bar and sat down in front of the TV and, um, yeah, looked forward to enjoying the last mountain stage of that Giro and and presumably another demonstration from Pantani. And it was just completely baffling to me for about half an hour. He was nowhere to be seen and no one was talking about him. And then finally the penny dropped and the commentators started talking about it. He wasn't in the race and there was no pink jersey that day. That was... um, well, we're going to talk about one of the other occasions when there was no pink jersey worn in uh, in a Giro stage later. But that day, by rights, it should have been worn by Paolo Savordelli. And um, he didn't in a gesture of sort of solidarity with Pantani, which was a sign of the times, really. I mean, Pantani had been kicked out ostensibly for, for doping, but, you know, the, the peloton felt that he'd been hard done to. I mean, what was so shocking about that was that 
you mentioned the, Fist- the Fistina scandal in '98. Where, you know, the Tour de France that Pantani had, of course, won, and there was, you know, with hindsight, a ludicrous conclusion drawn from that that '98 tour that the cheats had all been kicked out and the guys who'd made it to Paris were 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 clean um, and and were kind of carrying the flag for the sport. And and Pantani, you know, this is where discussing Pantani gets so complicated because. He was so thrilling to watch. You know, you you couldn't watch a race with Pantani and not feel excited. And he he was the architect of of some of the most dramatic and exciting racing in the nineties and 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 even you know on occasion into the early two thousands. Um, and that's what made that I think so shocking to have Pantani of all people kicked out of the Giro. Yeah, I think it marks the point where you know the UCI was starting to get to grips with the EPO situation. Obviously, there was no EPO test at the time, so although ostensibly it was a uh, he was kicked out for doping, it was one of those ones where they couldn't prove definitively. So they had the health check as they called it at the time. If the count of red blood cells went over 50%, then the rider was was withdrawn from the race and, and prevented from racing for a fortnight. So it's kind of a guilt without um, you know a, a proper conviction, if you like. And the Italians certainly saw it that way. Um, Paolo Savaldelli, who could have worn the pink jersey that morning, chose not to, wasn't wearing it in the evening either because Ivan Gotti and uh, Roberto Heras and Gilberto Simone went up the road by about five minutes or four, four or five minutes and uh, it was Gotti who won that Giro. But that's the one that Pantani always said uh, he he should have won by rights. He felt he deserved to have, have, uh, have won it. But, um, well, the authorities said otherwise. The Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for supporting Cycling Podcast. If you want 25% off all your Science and Sport products, go to scienceandsport.com, enter the code SISCP25. I am certainly consuming a lot of Science and Sport products at the moment as I make my way around Italy, having started off in Hungary. Um, and I can see that it's going to be essential fueling for me over the next well, two and a half weeks now. So thank you very much indeed to Science of Sport for their support. Now, we heard from him a, a few nights ago in our first episode on the Giro of Rebirth. John Dickey is uh, is your old professor, isn't he, um, Daniel? But also an expert on all things Italian and all things mafia. Yes, Rich. And John Dickey, he taught me a course on um, two Italian authors, um, Italo Calvino, which um, a lot of people would have heard of, who a lot of people would have heard of, and Cesare Pavese, um, way back in the distant dim past in the 1999 I think but John Dickey has become um, very well known um, in Italy and throughout the world for his books on the mafia I think Napalm you read Cosa Nostra which is a, a fantastic history of the Sicilian mafia um, and was a, a bestseller in lots of countries Mafia Brotherhoods as well and he's got a new one coming The Craft about Freemasons. As explained earlier in the episode, um, we thought it was about time we spoke to a real expert about the Mafia because uh, Napalm and I are certainly not that. And um, we are sending, or we were sending today's route through Corleone, um, famous, um, synonymous with the Godfather film and Don Vito Corleone. I asked John about that and whether the Sicilian Mafia is still deserving of its fearsome reputation. If you write something for the British press, the default thing to do is print a picture of Marlon Brando to illustrate it, you know, which obviously I don't get any say over or whatever. So I'm absolutely used to it. I also teach The Godfather now in the context of a course about organised crime. First is what it gets wrong about the mafia, why it isn't a good guide. The main thing is that it basically confuses the mafia, which is an organisation that draws on and exploits families to perpetuate itself the family as in kinship groups which are very distinct and the godfather doesn't give us the organization it it makes it into a kind of family saga 
about the dark side of the American dream. It doesn't clearly distinguish the Italian-American family and what happens to families that are, that are in the orbit of this organization. And the second point is that the Godfather is a prime example of the Mafia's own mythology. One of the things that distinguishes the Sicilian Mafia from a common or garden band of crooks is that it has an ideology that it spreads to its own members, but it also has a kind of cover story that literally since the 1870s, through its lawyers, through tame journalists, through politicians, it has spread about itself that attempts to confuse it with Sicilian or Italian-American culture. A lot of people who have seen it won't even be, they won't even remember that Corleone is a place as well that Don Vito subsequently adopts when he goes to the United States. But could one not make an argument that Corleone has in actual fact been an, a real nerve centre of um, Cosa Nostra activity um, and, and maybe the nerve centre par excellence in the last 60 or 70 years by virtue of the fact that some very, very prominent figures in Cosa Nostra yeah. have been from there. Corleone is notorious for two reasons. You're, you're right. First is the Godfather. And if you go to the main, to the square, right, or at least the area opposite the town hall in Corleone today, you will see that the bar there, the sort of main bar in the piazza, in the, well, little piazza, displays pictures of Val Pacino and so on in its windows yeah, and well. outside. Yeah, that's its, its kind of bit of tourist trash, if you like. In Italy, it is much more notorious among the general public because the worst crimes in the Mafia's history, the bloodiest period of the Mafia's history in the 1980s and early 1990s, was during a period where the dominant alliance within the Sicilian Mafia was known as the Corleonesi, because its leaders, notably Toto Riina, came from Corleone. But it's important to realise that that doesn't mean Corleone was the capital of the Mafia. Palermo is the capital of the Mafia. The Corleonesi, on the first hand, were an alliance of mafiosi right across the Sicilian Mafia. They weren't just the Mafia from Corleone. Mafiosi called them Corleonesi because their leader particularly came from Corleone. And, and just throwing it right forward to the present day, John, I mean, in the last couple of years, there have been some quite prominent commentators, scholars, and people of, in positions of in, influence have sort of um, declared sort of victory in the war over Cosa Nostra. There was the, another famous anti-mafia prosecutor magistrate last year, Pignatone. And Giuseppe, yeah. who said on, well, he, I think he's fairly seldom does he go on uh, national television, but he yeah, yeah, no, he's amazing, yeah, yeah, and he said that today the Sicilian mafia is much less dangerous than it was before. Uh, we can yeah. say that the mafia has been defeated, or the one capable of killing magistrates and attacking the state has been defeated. Yeah. What, what did you? What was your reaction when you heard that? Well, I, I agree with that completely. It doesn't mean the Mafia is dead, but it is in the worst crisis it's been in its 150-year history. It's still operative and still, you know, has such deep roots in the Sicilian economy and society that it's not going to be easy to uproot. But just to give you an idea how Italy has geared up, particularly since the early 1990s, geared up its anti-Mafia work is that the Sicilian Mafia, when things are running well, has a ruling body called the Commission that essentially, it does various things, but it's most important as a sort of arbitration body and negotiation body when business from different Mafia families in different territories overlaps. 
And the commission is very important to the smooth functioning of, of the mafia. That You know, it, they wouldn't have it if it wasn't important to them. The Sicilian mafia has tried to reform. The commission last met in 1993. That was when Riina was on his way to a meeting when he was arrested. And since then, they have tried to meet three times the commission, reform the commission. And on three occasions, participants have been bugged by the police, watched and arrested. Napalm, um, feeling any less nervous having heard that John Dickey thinks that the Cosa Nostra, the Sicilian Mafia, is, well, their most sort of murderous days are behind them? Very much so, yes. Although I wouldn't r- repeat driving a, a gleaming white Maserati around Sicily again. Do you remember? We did get some looks from cafes. Admiring looks. Admi- well, they were admiring, but also I sensed a slight menace in 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 the eyes of some people who are looking you know you, you, if you drive a car like that around uh, people might wonder where you've got the money for it from we've been to sicily a fair amount with the giro now and i think we've all we all agree that we've not really seen the best of sicily on the giro um napalm we had a a night in licata on the south coast a couple of years ago and um Ooh. Vividly remember you being chased by a dog. You were in your Republic of Ireland football top, and I remember you appearing over the brow of a hill, looking quite traumatised. You've been chased by the same dog as me on a run. Was it, was the dog an, an Italy supporter, or <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but um... took exception to Lionel's football top. Mistook my legs for some pasty chicken legs. We also we had a um, a recording session, didn't we, in Melfi, the home of Salvatore Puccio, the or birthplace of Salvatore Puccio, the the Ineos rider. Um, it, it's sometimes an acquired taste, Sicily. You listen to John Dickey there and and him talking about uh, Marlon Brando and the the Godfather, glamorizing the mafia and giving it a. Uh, a sort of air of of cool that is is probably very inappropriate or is very inappropriate and we're kind of guilty of that i mean i think we're all guilty of that not just us but cult as a culture glamorizing the mafia and um the reality of it as john dickie describes very very different but not probably all that helpful is it really to put that kind of organized crime and, and violence and death on this kind of glamorous pedestal in a way would also say that the ordinary people of sicily have always been extremely friendly and well I, you mentioned the the occasion where i got chased by the dog daniel we were in a really qu- very nice hotel weren't we and we had an excellent meal the lady running the hotel was almost kind of apologetic about the surroundings at the end of the the hotel's driveway you know the bins hadn't been collected the streets were all broken and and there was a kind of an exasperation to her body language that even even i picked up but um um, you know, everyone, everyone really friendly in restaurants and bars, and especially in the town where um, uh, Puccio was from, because we recorded there, and they were, uh, you know, they were bringing us snacks and that we hadn't ordered that we didn't end up paying for. So I mean, and maybe the were we in the Maserati that year? Maybe that was what did it. I don't know. <laughs> Just on that, um, Lionel. Yeah, I remember that in Licata, um, how, as you say, sort of apologetic our host was that night. And it's a hot topic in Italy at the moment how the mafia might try to exploit the coronavirus crisis. And actually, you know, we haven't got time to. Um, hear more about that today but it was something that John Dickey and I spoke about and particularly this issue of um, the mafia sort of stepping in to offer people loans when they've hit hard times and you know there's a feeling that that might start to happen Um, not just in Sicily but across the south of Italy um, administered by all of the different mafias in different regions. Well, Pastor Alan Norma, one of my favourites, uh, one for vegetarians as well, no no meat in it. Delicious. It's, it reminds me of this time of year, summery, bright, light. And uh, well, even there's even controversy about this dish because we can't definitively say what it's named after. Yeah, it's one that you can easily recreate at home. So let's hear from award-winning food writer, Guardian columnist and author of One More Croissant for the Road, Felicity Cloak. Il ristorante. Sir, Pastor Alan 
I think the name's a little bit unfortunate in the UK because Norma always reminds me of John Major's wife, Norma, and that famous spitting image sketch with the peas, um, which is not what the dish is about at all. Apparently, it's named after a Bellini opera of the same name because it's so beautiful, like the opera. And it's a very Mediterranean dish, actually. It's full of vibrant colours, you know, the lovely silky purple aubergines, the fresh tomatoes. Although I have to say, in this country, I would probably use tinned tomatoes unless it's uh, midsummer because they don't tend to go right in this country. So it's got quite high vegetable content, and then you've got the pasta. Actually, it's quite unusual. Many Italian dishes have really strict rules about what pasta you use with which sauce. But in this one, actually, it's quite a lot of leeway. But it's best if you use something that can hold quite a lot of sauce because it's quite chunky. So some big pasta shells or some sort of uh, rigatoni or something like that. Or those cartwheels are quite nice if you can find them. And then the cheese. The cheese is really important in this dish. It's not just the seasoning. Ideally, you would use ricotta salata, which is actually quite a salty, hard cheese. It's not the creamy stuff you get in the supermarket. You can use parmesan if you can't get that, although Italians will probably come and kill you. And a nice half way house is Pecorino Romano which is more widely available but just stick it all in toss it all together and I actually think this is a pasta dish that is really great kind of warm rather than as we'd say in this country piping hot but super delicious really summery love it well, Felicity, I can confirm that I did use tin tomatoes, but I also chucked in a couple of fresh ones that were probably a bit overripe for a salad. Okay. They'd probably just gone a bit past, uh, they were a bit squidgy, but they, they broke down nicely into the sauce. Uh, we also had rigatoni in there, quite a nice big tube. Would have liked the bicycle wheels, but couldn't find them, unfortunately. Pasta, oh, yeah. pasta was on a, um, a bit of a short supply in the UK when I was, uh, when I was making this dish. So uh, settled on the rigatoni. And, well, did it, did it look as nice and light and fresh and sp- spring slash summery as it tasted? Because it, it really did taste nice. I have to say that I really zoomed into the picture trying to find some fault with this and I have been picking from the fault department. Um, it looked really, really nice. Your aubergines, did you did you fry those aubergines? I did fry them, I didn't bake yeah. them. I know there's no, a... But they, they looked good. They can be a bit oily if you fry them, but actually yours didn't look oily. Um, as I said, I went into great detail. Um, and yeah, I think nice amount of sauce there. I Probably I would have gone heavier on the cheese, but you know, maybe that was a health consideration for you. Um, I love that enormous sprig of basil that you stuck on the top, almost like it was a salad. Um, I guess that was probably a bit chewy, but it did look pretty. So, um, yeah, top marks on this one. Impressed. The cheese was pecorino, and, um, well, I probably was a bit stingy on the cheese because it's quite expensive to buy in the UK. That is true, it's true. And I'm, you know, I'm... I'm I'm impressed by your thrift. It's a proper Italian nonna type thrift that, so, uh, you know, more marks for authenticity. Chaps, I'm looking for a, a wine to go with uh, uh, Lionel's lovely uh, pasta alla norma. Vino del giorno. Chin chin. So we've made it to Sicily where we've got the Fabrizio Vella Organic Bianco, which is made of 100% Caterato grapes and features in the cycling podcast Full Giro and Baby Giro. Now, the wine itself is made from Caterato grapes which are harvested early. They're all organic and they're then crushed in large acacia barrels left in contact with this juices left in contact with the skin for several hours up to a day and then transferred into large stainless steel fermenters that then ferment for a further 14 days. The wine itself only receives minimal amounts of sulfur and doesn't get fined or filtered so you could refer to this as a natural wine. Now the wine itself for me shows some sort of grapefruit citrus, lemon zest and on the nose certainly a fair whack of citrus blossom. It does have a little bit more complexity because of that skin contact that gives you a little texture and makes it a little more interesting. But for £10 this wine I think is fantastic value and well worth enjoying. Just don't get freaked out by the slightly cloudy nature. Enjoy. So yes, chaps, how are you enjoying the Fabrizio Vella? We, we've got the white and a red from Fabrizio Vella. We're going to go for the red t- today. We've got the, the white. It's um, a, a native Sicilian grape, a Catarato Bianco. Um, great acidity there. I've got there's a bit of I've got a bit of pear drops. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, minimal intervention winemaking. This is organic. It's not filtered. I hoped, uh, naively, I thought that over the course of Jira, we were going to get into the sort of the intricacies of biodynamic winemaking um, because that's something that Divine Cellars, our wine partner, sort of specialise in. But I think that was quite naive, probably. Um, with hindsight, I'm not sure, Rich, you got the patience for that, have you? But the reason, the reason um, that the, our wine of the day was strategically placed where it was in the episode was that, to my mind, um, one of the ten greatest scandals in Giro history is Richard or are Richard Moore's tasting notes, consistently awful and um, oh. <laughs> oh. well. This, this one is very nice indeed. Um, <laughs> very nice indeed is, uh, is is definitely a step up from nice or very nice. I've got three categories: nice, very nice, or very nice indeed. This, um, but there's real uh, clean, clear and clean sort of pale gold. Oh God, this is better. This is better. With aro aromas, aromas <laughs> of apricots, with a touch of tangerine, and and, and, and he I'm, says, "Well, I'm picking up a bit of fennel." He, he there, says, "Well, very dry, sipping from his a very dry wine with, with low acidity, sipping from his um, sherry glass that I can see, citrusy. <laughs> citrusy it does look like a sherry um, glass that Richard's drinking from." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, this one, this wine does go very well in a sherry glass. Um, you guys perhaps didn't know that, um, but no, this this is a a fine wine. Not so good with uh, Lionel's past Alan Norma. Maybe more uh, a ricotta ravioli with <laughs> mushrooms and truffles. Uh, that would be good. Or 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 seafood dish. I think a nice a nice crab a crab linguine would go very well with this. I feel this feels very wrong. There's been some wine doping going on here. Richard's used the internet to find out what the wine should go with. <laughs> no, actually, I I made up the crab linguine. Everything else, I I plagiarised, but um, <laughs> the, it would go well with a nice uh, a nice seafood dish, definitely. Do you still ch cook chicken a la mango? I remember that was your only dish. You used to cook that for all your dates. Back in the day, no, Daniel, <laughs> mango Daniel, chicken. Daniel. Um, I'm doing lots of lots of dishes in lockdown. <laughs> let me tell you, I'm being very creative. Back to the cycling scandals. What's our next one, please? I think we're up to number seven. Well, I think we were going to go for Eddie Merckx testing positive in in Savona in uh, 1968, weren't we? Being kicked out of the Giro, Giro that he almost certainly would have won, a bit like Pantani in 1999. And um, yeah, he tested positive for a stimulant. Well, he, he was actually convicted, as it were, found guilty. But back in those days, it really was a, a sort of slap on the wrist. And um, they, in the, the formal wording, um, when the, the sentence was announced, it, it was said that he should get the benefit of the doubt. And sure enough, he was back at the start line uh, for the Tour de France not long later and dominated that Tour de France. But some cracking stories about that positive test. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen the images of Merck's sort of weeping, sobbing in his bed in Savona while the Giro left without him. Um, very evocative, very famous um, images certainly in, in, mm. in Italian sport. Well, there's a lot of detail, obviously, about that episode in your book, Daniel, about Eddie Merckx. Uh, I think you managed to uncover some details about it that weren't weren't so well known. It was Vincenzo Torriani himself, wasn't it, who who went to his room to break the news to him, the Giro director. So there were some great stories um, about that. I think my favourite one was well, there were, there were all sorts of theories, conspiracy theories. It being Italy, um, in the Italians love a conspiracy theory. But look, my favourite one was that. This a priest surfaced, a, a priest from Parma, the stage that day, the day before, so the, the stage when Merckx tested positive had left from, set out from Parma. Before the stage that day, Merckx had gone to the cathedral in Parma um, for mass or to say some kind of prayer. A priest had seen him, but he'd also sort of looked through the doors of the cathedral, looked outside and seen Merckx's bike propped up and noticed that the, there was no bottle in the bottle cage. And then a few minutes later, he looked again, did a double take and there was a bottle all of a sudden. Merckx hadn't left his position behind the pews in the in the church and the priest had come to the conclusion that, you know, someone must have taken the bottle away and, and put something in the bottle. There, there was also the theory, a hypothesis that Torriani had orchestrated the whole thing out of spite towards the Tour de France and and um, its director Felix Leviton that 
Um, Torriani wanted Merckx to miss the Tour de France that, that year, um, get, get a doping ban so he'd miss it. Just the, the hyperbole around what it meant and the, the dimensions of that scandal. I mean, a few days after it happened, the University of Liège carried out a sociological study measuring the impact um, of the scandal on the Belgian public. It concluded that um, of recent world events, only the assassination of President John F. Kennedy six years earlier had been of similar magnitude. And he went to the Tour de France and put in possibly the, the greatest performance of his entire career, didn't he, to win the Tour that year. So Torriani's great plan, if that's what it was, kind of backfired. Um, our next top in our top 10, number eight, is another Belgian, another iconic Belgian rider. So yeah, Rich, in the 1978 Giro, uh, one of our favourites, um, friend of the podcast, he doesn't know he's a friend, but honorary friend of the podcast, uh, Roger de, Fl- de-, de Vlamink was riding for the Brooklyn team, and um, his teammate, Johan de Munch, was, well, he was going to win that Giro, but de Vlamink wasn't very happy about being his domestique and having to help him, and on the Paso Mangen, halfway up the Paso Mangen, um, de Vlamink apparently veered off off the road, put his bike down, I presume, and just escaped, disappeared into the woods. <laughs> there was a great quote from, so another Brooklyn rider, Ercole Gualazzini, who told Herbie Sykes, who we heard from earlier, Roger threw his bike um, into the woods like a maniac, then ran off straight into the forest. I thought, what am I supposed to do now? But I decided I should run after him to try to get him to come back. He was a good runner, Roger, and I couldn't catch him. I was left scrabbling around in the trees, calling after him like an idiot, but he just vanished. I mean, extraordinary. Never never really been verified, don't make, has don't it? Don't make them like that anymore. Napalm, you, you, you <laughs> met De Munch a, a, a couple of years ago, didn't you? The Pink Panther, the last Belgian to win the Giro. And I think you asked him, asked him about this, didn't you? Yeah, I went with Jan-Peter de Vlieger, our good friend. Uh, from Belgium, and uh, well, both both de Vlamink and de Moink really sort of ducked this story. And and uh, I mean, there is a bit in our friend's special from a couple of years ago. But de Moink was a real kind of um, unassuming character, really the opposite of de Vlamink. Well, first of all, I had lunch with de Vlamink and Jan Peter, and it was it was it was like having lunch with the did, the Mad did you not Hatter. recreate? Did you not recreate um, De Vlamink scampering to the woods um, at the sight of his his dog, Lionel? Yes, I did. Yes, big dogs. Yeah, he has owner of big dogs. <laughs> we we went on a wild goose chase looking for an open restaurant on a. On but no llamas. No llamas. No no, no, no llamas. He claimed I... not. He claimed not to own any llamas. <laughs> but the thing with De Vlamink was that I had this sense that everything he was saying, he he might say differently <laughs> the next day and then differently again the day after that, and that it depended who you were and how you know if, if I was paying for the interview I suspect I might have got some better stories but um, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was I don't know I think de Blamink is, is very aware of his uh, you know his almost cult status isn't he and uh, I mean it was a very entertaining lunch don't get me wrong but I didn't come out of it feeling like I knew the story of the 1978 Giro uh, all that uh, much better. De Moink, on the other hand, we were in his house, in his front room, and there were a few little mementos around. Uh, you know, he had a couple of books about his uh, Giro win on the bookcase, but no other real sense. You could have just been in a, a, a regular grandpa's front room, really. It was very, very pleasant chat, but um, no real sense that this was Belgium's last, not just last Giro winner, but last Grand Tour winner. At the very end, he went off and got his sort of silky time trial Malia Rosa, which was a really lovely um, uh, item of memorabilia to see. And apparently the only thing he kept from that Giro, or the only thing he had in his house anyway. I thought the special came out quite well. It was a sort of a, a meandering trip through the vagaries of Belgian cycling and, and these rivalries that grow life and stories of their own don't they without, without anyone really knowing what's true and, and what isn't and I suppose it doesn't really matter uh, my version of it now is that the Vlaming ran off into the woods and that's that 
And for our ninth uh, scandal from the, the Giro, or Giri past, is uh, we're going all the way back to 1967, aren't we, Daniel? Yes, we are, Rich. Yeah. And do you know what I'm going to do here? I'm going to adjust my bow tie and gaze at my navel, and I'm going to read something that I wrote myself in a book. Oh, my yeah, word. Yeah, I wrote about this. It's, Modesty is... Uh, <laughs> it's thin on the ground. Short supply here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, 1967 Giro... Not for the first or final time in his career as organiser of Italy's greatest bike race, Vincenzo Torriani expected applause and all he got was scorn. By taking the Giro d'Italia to the Tre Cime di Lavaredo, Torriani believed that he pulled off a masterstroke, his umpteenth capolavoro. If the Dolomites were Italy's Giza, the Tre Cime were their great pyramids. The road from Misurina to the Rifugio Auronso, 2,349 metres above sea level, was also about to become one of the Giro's famed one of the Giro's fabled climbs. At least that was the theory. Instead, on the morning of June the 9th, 1967, Torriani glanced at a copy of La Gazzetta dello Sport, no less than the paper which had created and still funded the race, and winced. The Mountains of Dishonor was the front page headline. So, what happened? The Giro, as it, as I explained there, went to the Tre Cime di Lavaredo, a very famous climb now for the first time, and everyone, pretty much everyone, got pushed. Torriani had to call the stage or he declared it null and void because well, it's a very steep climb and there were a lot of fans up there. Yeah, it was completely, the result was completely falsified by, well, what La Stampa called despicable pushes. Jacques Anquetil was riding, um, he was coming to the end of his career, but he said they even pushed me. I mean, Anquetil was famously unpopular in Italy, so pretty much, it, yeah, everyone got got the kind of push that you guys might be needing on a few stages of our Giro, no doubt. Well, it's funny because we last night spoke about stars and water carriers and I mentioned the other um, great films made around that time, La Course en Tête and The Greatest Show on Earth. And in The Greatest Show on Earth in particular, there's a lot of pushing but also, and also an awful lot of trying to clamp down on it. Uh, you know, that was a few years later, but... I don't know if it was a particular problem in Italy, but it was something that the organisers really did seem to try to, to stop, um, which was a bit like trying to stop the tides. You know, it was... We, we know how passionate Italian fans are, and I think back then in particular, um, the Tifosi were, you know, keen to get quite involved in the racing. And, yeah, as you say, on some of these steeper climbs, Daniel, that, that sort of pushing um really could um you know have have a real impact on the racing on the results well indeed rich um i think that's nine we've got now what is number 10 what is our 10th giro scandal <laughs> lionel what's our 10th giro scandal well it's the most recent is it is it too young to be a scandal it's not really a vintage scandal yet is it it's only from six years ago 2014 possibly the first Giro social media scandal because uh, Twitter was involved inevitably as it is in so many scandals now it was the question of whether Nairo Quintana and others uh, pressed on on the descent of the Stelvio in terrible weather um, the, in the uh, well the rest of the riders were or many of the rest of the riders were in the uh, under the impression that the stage had been neutralised. And, well, there's a whole chain of events to unpick um, as to what happened when and who heard what when. But even the Giro Twitter feed had uh, announced that the stage had been neutralised. That tweet was later deleted. I mean, that's that's it, isn't it? Bang to rights. Any court in the world would uh, come to the conclusion based on that evidence. But Quintana, Pierre Roland and Ryder Hesiodal pressed on and Quintana took the pink jersey from his compatriot Rigoberto Uran and went on to win his first Grand Tour. And well, it was it was a it blew up as a big storm and settled down again. And it's not really referred to these days, is it? In dispatches, um, it was. Uh, I don't know what your memories of that day are and whether or not um, Quintana was. Uh, out of order or within his rights. For me, it was a sort of evidence of Quintana's kind of killer instinct and, and a sign for me that this was going to be the guy who was going to dominate Grand Tours because it was a year after he'd finished second at the, the Tour de France to Chris Froome as a very young, you know, promising rider who got stronger as the race went on. And for him to then go to the Giro, which was in itself quite 
not controversial, but quite surprising, having finished second in the Tour to go and make the Giro his main focus of 2014. Um, you know, it seemed to me that he was the coming man. And looking back now, we can probably say that um, that was the best of Quintana, wasn't it, that 2014 Giro? Yeah, I think so. I mean, one thing that occurs to me um, when th- this idea came up to include um, this incident in our in our top 10 was how different it might have been if an Italian had been really in contention to win that Giro. Uh, Fabio Adel was third and he finished uh, about four minutes down overall um, at the end of the Giro. But, you know, another another incident we considered and would probably be in most people's list was the 1984 Giro when uh, Francesco Moser um, edged out Laurent Fignon and um, there was all sorts there were all sorts of allegations about sort of um, chauvinism and, and you know um, favoritism towards Moser being shown there there was the famous stage where the Stelvio was cut from the route um, and the TV helicopters flew over the Stelvio and they showed that um, contrary to what the race organisation was saying there was no snow on the Stelvio it was perfectly passable and then the final time trial to Verona I can't remember was it the were the was the claim that the helicopter had flown below or sort of behind uh, Moser and favoured him or in front of Fignon and obstructed it, it, um, him? It, it, the helicopter actually attached a rope to Moser's <laughs> bike and, uh, and dragged him dragged him to the finish. It was very, very effective. But that that was the sort of example par excellence of you know, favouritism. Uh, Moser might have got in the helicopter at one point, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> favouritism towards Italian riders. Um, you know, Moser who weighed about 160 kilos and somehow managed to win that win that Giro. One of the most extraordinary <laughs> yeah, Giro mm. winners. Yeah, that, that probably deserved to be in there ahead of Quintana. But we wanted a sort of more recent one. And the point you make about social media is is a good one Lionel you you look back at some of these um other stories and wonder how they'd have played out in the social media age it'd be very different oh the whole world would be team roach hashtag team roach hashtag team <laughs> and teeny there'd be oh there'd be all sorts going on wouldn't there there'd be the, can, the the jury of twitter would decide who the race winner was not the road can, before we wind up tonight can i have your top three please in order for each of you what how would you rank the, the top three of of those in 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 uh, severity well i think uh, well your your tasting notes on the wine would definitely be in the top three for me i think i'll, I'll give that <laughs> th- third um i think the police it was, it's always it's it's nice to be a protagonist in one of these um so i would say that a cc police raid would be number two and it has to be <laughs> taking the garibaldi biscuit garibaldi of course synonymous with sicily and um, his expedition of the thousand um and his landing in marsali in sicily where where Close to where we've landed, coming back from Hungary. That was a key event in uh, the reunification of Italy in 1861. Taking the biscuit, the Garibaldi biscuit for me is the 2002 Giro, which, um, as I said at the start of the episode, it it really um, shocked me just to to realise the extent of the skullduggering scandal in that Giro. Although, you know, I was very much following it at the time. It was a drip, 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 wasn't it, that one? I I would put that one third. I would put Merck's... uh, in Savona, a close second to Pantani in 99. I think because it was Pantani, because of what he meant in Italy, because of the the state the sport was in at the time, on the precipice, really, um, I think that 99 Pantani... Um, scandal was was the biggest uh, in Giro history. What about you, Lionel? Well, I hate to agree with you, Richard, on anything at any time, but I think you mm. got the order spot on there. I think the, the Merckx one, though, you know, Merckx's career might never have happened. If, if the same circumstances happened now, that would be pretty much it for a, for a rider, no matter how talented they were. I mean, they would come back, but they'd have to sit out a couple of years and the shadow would be you know cast long over their, their reputation, wouldn't it? So it's extraordinary that you know, Merckx's era of absolute dominance could have been cut off at, before it got started if, uh, if the sport had operated on today's lines back then. That's our rattle through 10 scandals at the Giro d'Italia. There are, a lot, there are lots more we could do a part two, but we're not going to do that. Well, we're we going to move on to something else. We didn't, we didn't even really consider the, um, the pre-war years, and I'm sure, you know, as there are with the Tour de France, there are many stories to do with the Giro and cheating and, you know, people getting trains and, and you know, 
so I, on I so heard forth. that Alfredo Binder once had a cappuccino at 6 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> and he should be stripped of all his victories, and the, the <laughs> toe straps that <laughs> that uh, bore his name should be renamed. What a fraud! What an absolute <laughs> fraud! Anyway, what's coming up tomorrow, chaps? I, I've I'm lost. I, as I, I, at this point in any grand tour, I'm kind of I've lost my way. I don't know where I am anymore. <laughs> You've usually been dispatched at this point, haven't you? You've been sent home from the Giro. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. So I sw- I'm switching off now. Um, and uh, I'll take a sort of back seat while you two steer us through the next few days. Well, what's what's tomorrow? Well, tom- I've forgotten. T- genuinely, tomorrow. Let's start with the geography. We're going from Agrigento down the well, the southern coast, uh, across the southern coast of Sicily. We're going east to Modica, and it's an area. So the sort of bottom, the bottom uh, southeast corner of Sicily. Not an area of Sicily that I know well, but I'm I'm told by a lot of my Italian friends that that is the place to to visit in um, Sicily, so Ragusa, Modica area. So I'm looking forward to that. I've actually been there. I've actually, <laughs> I've actually been, been around there quite a bit, actually, lying on a holiday a few years ago. So I'll, I'll be your guide Yeah, you'll tomorrow, be driving the worry. bus tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, well, that's, and, that's coming tomorrow. And editorially, what have we got tomorrow? We've got the supernovas. What are the supernovas, mm. Napalm? People who burned very brightly for... Um, perhaps a very brief period of time, some briefer than others. Um, but, but A bit but like me in this Giro. Yeah, but specifically, um, you know, Giri uh, phenomena, um, rather than people who went on and did uh, great things in, in other races, uh, people who made their mark in the Giro, but perhaps didn't uh, do a great deal else in other races. And then stage six is looking back at 2002 through the eyes of Cadell Evans, his, uh, his great collapse uh, came within a few days of winning. The greatest eruption, explosion maybe in recent Giro history on Mount Etna. We, you, you boys will be climbing Mount Etna that day. And, um, yeah. Yes, we will. Yeah, we will. Oh, great. Okay. Um, well, to avoid his fate, I'll be stocking up on science and support products. And, uh, <laughs> and wine. Um, a, a quick, a quick Don't reminder. Mix them, and, wine and wine. Before we go, um, a reminder that if you sign up as a friend of the Cycling Podcast, you can um, get access to a film that we have produced following uh, Larry Warbass and Connor Dunn on their No Go Tour a couple of years ago. And so we rode. It's called. And it's available exclusively to friends of the podcast. So if you sign up now for the next month, you'll be able to watch it. Uh, go to thecyclingpodcast.com. That's all for tonight. Thank you very much, Lionel Burning. Thank you, Richard. And thank you very much, Daniele Friberincini. Thank you, chaps. Thank you.